Welcome to your online lecture for pathologies of the knee. You will notice that there probably are some pathologies that you're all aware of that we will not discuss in this particular lecture. Again, the purpose of, of these lectures in this course is really just to give you the most common types of pathologies that you might see in your first semester um, in the clinical setting. And then of course, we'll dive deeper um, and add more pathologies once we get into our evaluation course. But for now, I just wanna make sure that you can recognize the most common signs and symptoms of the most common pathologies that will come into the clinic during your fall uh, session in the clinical realm. So uh, we're going to talk about pathologies of the knee. And I know that most of you have either taken a gross anatomy course or will are currently taking a gross anatomy course. But I still kind of want to spend a little bit of time in this segment discussing the anatomy of the knee because to me it's important that we all have uh, the same knowledge and understanding of the gross anatomy of the knee. So this is a, is a knee model. Um, and so if we're looking at this, this is a, the most proximal portion of the knee joint, and then this is the most distal portion of the knee joint. So for perspective, this is going to be the femur, right? So this is gonna be the femur bone, and then distally, this is going to be the tibia, and then on that lateral side of the knee, we have the, the fibula. And this joint together as, as a whole is called the tibial femoral joint, right? And it gets its name based on really the two bones that um, are articulating or um, interacting with one another. So tibial, meaning tibia, femoral joint, meaning femur. Uh, the, the fibula, if you ask some researchers, what they would say is it's really not a part of, of the knee joint. It's a part of the superior, right, tibial fibular joint, but it certainly doesn't have any articulation to the femur. So when we're referring to the knee joint, what we're really saying is referring to either the femur and or the tibia, but that fibula doesn't have any articulation per se with the knee joint. So I wanted to, to clarify that first. Um, so if we're starting proximally and we're just looking at the anatomy of the, of the knee joint, a few things come to mind that I think are important for you guys. Uh, as, as the femur progresses from a proximal position to a distal position, what you'll start to see is that it, it starts to widen out. Um, and at its widest points, right, so here and here, at its widest points, these are called condyles, right? So these are the large ball-like structures. And that becomes important to know because it's those condyles, right, that will um, articulate with the tibia. So do you, can you guys see that clearly there? So we've got large, the widest part of the femur, which are the condyles. And then those condyles kind of round off, right? Um, and they are what articulate with the, the tibia distally, right? And then if we were to kind of transect away the femur or remove it completely, then within the tibial femoral joint, we have these cartilaginous structures called menisci, right? Or meniscal, meniscus, depending on who you ask, right? So meniscus would be singular. And then if we're referring to both of them, then they would be considered, they would be considered the menisci of the knee. And then you can see this little blue-like structure right in here, right? That little space right in here. Well, that's the what is called tibial plateau or the flattest portion of, of the tibia. And it's that portion that is responsible for articulating with our femur. Can you guys see that okay? So we've got femur, right? If we flex the knee and look deep, that little blue structure there and here, that's what these guys, these condyles right here articulate with when we're flexing and extending our, our knee. And then distally we have we have the tibia, right? And on that tibia, I don't know if you can see it very clear in this video, but right here we have the uh, tibial tuberosity, which will be responsible for receiving, um, guess what? The patellar ligament itself, okay? So I'm gonna back up away from that and then as we discuss other pathologies, I'll be more specific in the anatomy of the knee, but for now, you need to know that the tibial femoral joint is comprised of the femur proximally and the tibia distally, and it's the articulation of these two bones that make up the uh, tibial femoral joint. I, I assume that Professor Noakes is covering this, but if not, the, the tibial femoral joint is a hinge joint. And so I kind of equate that to um, opening a door, right? So like if I were to walk outside of my office right now, and if I were to open and pull that door, it's on a hinge, right? So it can swing forward and backwards, and that's it. Similarly, with the knee joint, it's a hinge joint. So in essence, it can move into knee flexion, it can move into knee extension, right? It's hinging upon something, right? So it's called a hinge joint for that particular reason. All right, let's go ahead and segue into the pathologies of, of the knee joint. 
Um, and so when we're, when we're thinking about pathologies that plague the knee joint um, and common pathologies that plague the knee, point, knee joint, the first uh, group of pathologies are going to be the collateral ligaments. There are two collateral ligaments, one on the medial side of the knee and one on the lateral side of the knee. And so we'll talk about those two ligaments separately because the way they're injured is going to be different. So the, the mechanism of injury for a, a medial collateral ligament is sprain is going to be by valgus force. So let's go ahead and take a look at, at that. I'm on the medial side of the knee, and I know that because the fibula is over here. So if we're looking at the medial side of the knee, the, the ligament that, you, that we are looking at right here is our medial collateral ligament. It has a distal attachment to the tibial flare, and then it has a proximal attachment to the medial epicondyle on the, the femur. So we can see how the two joints or the two bones are being held together by one ligament on the medial side. That one ligament is the medial collateral ligament. So its major role is to provide stability to the inside of the knee. So far so good, guys? Okay, now the hard part um, to kind of reconcile with is this idea that in order to injure this medial collateral ligament, there has to be a lateral force to the knee, okay? So what am I saying? Uh, I, I maybe get wrapped as a football player on the outside of my knee, and when I do that, it forces my knee into a valgus load, right? And you can see the stretch that is happening. I take a blow on this side of the knee. As a result, the, t the tibia and femur open up, and now we get a stretch of that medial collateral ligament, right? That blow to the lateral side of the knee, so blow opening up of the medial side of the knee, is called a valgus force, okay? So it takes a valgus force to injure the MCL, right? On the opposite end of that, on the lateral side of the knee, we have a very small ligamentous structure known as the lateral collateral ligament. The lateral collateral ligament, as you guys can see here, has a distal attachment to that fibular head. Uh, and then it's going to come up proximally and attach to the lateral epicondyle of, of the femur, right? So its major role is to provide lateral stability to the lateral side of the knee, okay? And it's injured in an opposite force. So there's a blow to the medial side of the knee, which causes the lateral side of the knee to open up. That's called a varus force, okay? So if I take a blow to the medial side of my knee and my lateral knee joint opens up by, by way of varus force, then essentially what's going to happen is that lateral collateral ligament is going to get sprained. And you guys can see in this video how that lateral collateral ligament's major job is to keep that lateral side of the knee stable, right? So if I have a tight LCL, I get a little bit of opening, but if I have a sprained LCL, oh man, I'm gonna have a massive amount of instability on that lateral side of the knee. So just as, as a recap, we've got two collateral ligaments. We have the medial collateral ligament, which is a lot larger, and we'll go into more detail in lower extremity evaluation, but it's a lot larger, it's a lot thicker. And to me, it makes sense. Like when we're thinking about the way that God created our body, let's, let's just think deeply about this. Um, we know that the lateral side of the knee is more exposed, right? It's on the outside. It's it's free to be injured or to be uh, impacted more often, right? And so we know that there's going to be a lot of valgus forces on that medial side of the knee because the lateral side of the knee is exposed, right? It, we're going to see more valgus forces. So isn't it neat to think that um, our MCL is a lot thicker because more than likely we're going to see more forces being applied to the medial side of the knee. I don't know about you, but I think that's just amazing. Okay, so all that said, we've got LCL, which is going to hold the lateral side of the knee together. We have the MCL, which is going to hold the medial side of the knee together. And if we have injury to either of those, we create instability, right? Instability on the lateral side if that LCL is injured, instability on the medial side if the uh, medial collateral ligament is injured. Either way, we have an unstable knee. Uh, and when we start talking about uh, participating in sports, you cannot have an instability at a knee because it could lead to more catastrophic injuries as that athlete continues to, to progress, okay? So in terms of uh, the medial collateral ligaments, 
what, what I said in the video, the anatomy video is exactly what I'm going to say here, that if you have a blow to the lateral side of the knee, which is often more often exposed, right? So if you have a blow to that lateral side of the knee, then that MCL is going to get compromised because this is what's called a valgus force. So again, mechanism of injury is going to be an acute lateral or valgus blow to the knee, which causes that medial side of the knee to open up and stretch the actual MCL. And then the opposite is going to be the case, right? And essentially what you have happening is a blow to the medial aspect of the knee, creating a varus force, right? And then you have the LCL becoming injured. What I can say is that LCL injuries are more rare when, when you compare them to MCL injuries. And it has to do with the fact that the lateral side of the knee is more exposed to, to blows. And so as a result, you have more MCL injuries, right? Does that remind you of the ankle joint and the lateral versus the medial ligaments? I'm, I'm hoping you guys are kind of connecting the dots there. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk signs and symptoms. Um, the, the number one sign and symptom that will be reported in a patient who has an MCL or an LCL sprain is laxity or joint looseness, right? And if it's to the MCL or the medial collateral ligament, that patient is going to complain of the laxity on the medial side of the knee, right? They're going to complain of looseness or instability on that medial side of the knee, right? Because that ligament is no longer holding those bones together, right? So if I'm trying to pull those bones apart, if I'm a strong, tight ligament, I'm not going to let them pull. But when I become sprained, however, you see the amount of laxity that could be present in, in a tibial femoral joint, right? Same thing applies for an LCL injury. The difference is the laxity is going to be on, on the lateral side. What we've also seen with uh, MCL and LCL ligaments is that because they're so close to the joint space, you'll see uh, swelling from the injury actually leak into the joint space of the knee. And so that's where I say there's swelling in, in the joint line, right? You have swelling all over the entire tibial femoral joint, depending on the grade um, of, of tear, right? And the grade of tears is going to be the same as it was for an ankle injury. The grade one, you're going to have some microscopic tearing, right? The grade two, you're going to have some absolutely ligamentous tearing. Then a grade three, you're going to have a, a complete rupture, right? Um, and with the grade three, what we're really concerned about is just how unstable that joint will be. That patient may complain that their knee may feel like it's dislocating or um, subluxing either medially or laterally depending on which ligament is compromised, right? Um, and so then, of course, the in, with an injury to the MCL or an LCL, you, you can also have a patient who complains of pain. And the complaints of pain can occur in three different regions, right? Depending on where the tear happens. If the tear happens more proximally, then that patient's going to complain of pain right on that proximal attachment site. So right over the epicondyle of the femur, if it's a mid-substance tear, then that patient's usually going to complain of pain right in the joint line space, so like right in here. And then if the tear happens more distally, then they're going to complain of pain on the distal attachment. In this case, this happens to be the fibular head attachment, right? Because this is the LCL. So the pain will tell you where the actual tear has happened for that particular ligamentous structure. Okay, there are two special test that we can use in the clinical setting to help us determine wh whether or not they're actually, whether or not our patient actually has a torn ligament. So just imagine that I'm laying my patient down here and this is the lateral side as you guys can see. If I want to test the LCL, then my hand is gonna go here on the fem femur, right? My hand is gonna go there on the femur. And guess what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna apply a varus load. So I'm gonna do something like this, right? Do you see that? So what I'm gonna try to do is open up the joint space. If I have a tight ligament, I'm gonna create a tight ligament, that joint won't open up. If I have a ruptured ligament or a sprain ligament, that joint is gonna keep opening and keep opening and keep opening, right? And the cool thing in the clinical setting is you guys will actually feel that, right? So what we're looking at here, on this right side is exactly what I just did with the model. You, you see that clinician applying a varus load to open up the lateral side of the knee. And then on the opposite end of that spectrum, you guys, if you have an MCL sprain, then you're going to be applying a valgus load, a load to the lateral knee to see if that medial side will, will open up. And if you get movement, 
of the two bones, then that would be considered either a positive varus or a positive valgus. Now you all might be sitting here saying, are we gonna do this? The answer is yes, we'll do these in the fall. Okay, so in terms of management of, of ligamentous sprains in the knee, uh, it's a little bit it's a little bit different um, because some ligaments don't heal as well because there's less vascularity or blood supply about the knee. So what we know about LCLs in particular is that the lateral side of the knee doesn't have as much vascular or blood supply to it. So those take a lot longer to heal themselves and most often can require surgical intervention to, to repair because there just isn't enough blood flow going to that lateral side of the knee, therefore it can't heal, right? Any ligament, any muscle, any tendon in our body, what we know about healing rates is that in order for them to, to heal fast, their blood supply, right? New oxygen, uh, red blood cells need to infiltrate that area. So in an area where you have a lack of blood supply, then the, it's either a slower healing time or surgery might be required to restore function to that particular ligament or anatomical structure, right? And so LCL might take a little bit longer to resolve itself or might require uh, surgical intervention. Your MCL, however, there's a little bit more blood supply on the medial side of the knee. Therefore, um, it doesn't take as long and is a little bit easier to, to treat. But in general, we're going to price it, right? We're gonna protect it, rest it, ice it, compress it, and elevate it. Probably wanna do that for about 72 hours or so. And if your patient's joint effusion or swelling hasn't gone down, right? If your patient still can't ambulate, if there's still massive amounts of laxity, then what you wanna do is refer out for an MRI just to make sure that the patient doesn't have a grade three um, rupture, if that makes sense, okay? All right, uh, other than that, one of the things that we see with uh, lateral collateral and uh, medial collateral ligamentous sprains is sometimes concomitantly, uh, the patient will suffer from an ACL rupture so we're gonna talk about that in a separate slide, but uh, essentially what you wanna do is anytime you rule out an MCL or an LCL sprain, you should also be ruling out an ACL sprain because typically the two are most often linked. Uh, in the case that your patient is completely unstable, then we wanna put them in some type of hinge brace. So what's that mean? A hinge means we can lock it and we can unlock it, right? So uh, eventually what we wanna do in the earlier phases of healing for these ligaments is we actually wanna lock the brace at zero degrees. What am I saying? I'm saying that we don't wanna allow our patient to flex. Anyone wanna guess why you wouldn't want your patient with an MCL or an LCL uh, sprain to flex early on in the rehab process? Yeah, you got it, right? It's, it's this idea that when we flex, you'll see it here, what's happening to that ligament? Do you see it? What's happening to it? It's stretching, right? If we keep them in a locked position, such as in, in extension, then that ligament is allowed to heal. It's not, there's no stress being placed on it. But as soon as we unhinge that brace, right, and we do something like this and allow them to start flexing, what we're allowing them to do is also stretch that ligament. So sometimes putting them in that hinge joint brace will protect the ligament from um, undue stress for a little while to allow them to heal or while we're protecting that particular joint. And if you don't have a hinge brace, then the recommendation is just to protect them. So to limit, um, to limit weight bearing with either crutches. I mean, on our campus, our main campus, it's extremely hilly. So sometimes what we'll do is get them like one of those scooters, those motorized scooters, um, or you certainly could put them in a wheelchair, but that's probably way extreme, right? Okay, we move on to the ACL, which is great, right? Because we just talked about um, the MCL and LCL and how more than likely if someone injures their MCL or LCL, they're also gonna have a concomitant ACL injury potentially. Um, so let's talk about the mechanism of ACL, um, ACL sprains because the reality is I'm sure you all at least know about the fact that it exists, right? When we're thinking about athletics or news within athletics, a lot of times what's center stage? ACL ruptures, right? Um, so there are two different ways in which the ACL can be injured. So I kind of want to make that clear, but the mechanism of injury is always going to be, you ready? It's going to be, here it is, this is medial side. So just think it's going to be a valgus load, everybody tracking there, and then you're gonna get some external tibial rotation. So I'll do it again, ready? Valgus load and that tibia is going to be moving externally. So we can see the valgus load is what causes the MCL injury. Does that make sense? 
And then if we look really deep, let me move this patellar ligament. If we look really deep, we're gonna see the ACL in this model, right? So let's do that again. A valgus load, and then can you see how that external rotation tugs on that ACL, right? Okay, so the mechanism of injury is most often always going to be a valgus load coupled with tibial external rotation, right? And, and most often that occurs in cutting right or pivoting uh so that's the mechanism but there are two ways in which the acl can actually become injured right the first one is indirect contact and i always start with that one first or non-contact because there there's a reality here that most of the acl injuries that we see happen because of non-contact. That volleyball player who's going up for a spike comes down and ruptures her ACL. That soccer athlete who's dribbling the ball goes to pivot or cut, right? And then guess what? The ACL gives out. That football athlete, right? Who maybe is going to cut or running back who's going to cut and ACL gives way, right? So that's non-contact, not as often talked about, but certainly happens probably more often than not. And then the way that we see most often reported in like your ESPNs or other sports shows would be contact, right? And that's more intuitive to us as clinicians. Someone wrapped my knee, I fell down and I felt a pop, right? Or someone slide tackled my my the lateral side of my knee, it went in and I fell down in an external tibial motion, right? So you can injure an ACL either way, okay? So you should be prepared for someone to come in and say, I was just cutting, I felt a pop, and I went down. That would be non-contact, right? Versus a patient who comes into your clinic and says, yeah, I was, I was running with the ball, and then someone wrapped my knees, and I felt a pop, right? So you want to be prepared for either mechanism of injury, but essentially what they should be describing to you is a valgus load happened, and somehow they had a rotation moment um, at, at the foot. Does that make sense, guys?